Really? You got it? Okay. <laughs> I'll hold the Hi, camera. everybody. Welcome to, the, <laughs> welcome to the RDRV show. Tonight, we're going live. As you can tell, let's get to some questions and hopefully some answers. I know um, we are uh, had a question about how to build a light box. And my suggestion on that light box, uh, if you're going to be doing the old English method of stained glass, working on the light box, the best first thing to do, the best thing to do is to get the light first. So that once you have the light, then you can build the box. Typically, you want your light box to be around two foot by three foot, and they do make shop lights that are 36 inches wide. So you can build your box, but only, I would say only after you get your light. And you know, our first light box for the very first stained glass window that I ever built at home was a dresser drawer with a light bulb in it and an old 3 8 inch thick glass tabletop that was scratched all to pieces. But you know what? It worked, it was awesome, and everything came out the way it's supposed to be. So we're happy about that. So question, any questions? Um... Gary, what's the question, best rod for plant stakes? What would that be? What would that be? Like, um... Are, are, you, uh, are you making something to, to put in the ground? Um, similar to our Christmas trees that we make. Uh, I try to use the, actually, the 8th inch diameter brass uh, portion of the hinge for your jewelry boxes. So I will try to I'll try to use that because you don't really need to stick them up. I think you have one. Right I over do there. have one right over here. If you're talking about small. If small, you're talking about small stuff. Let me go over there. Um, pick it up. We're kind of you know this is our studio slash work area here. And... So this is just the. This is just the eighth inch diameter brass hinge. It's the, it's the heavy part of it. Then of course, you know you have another smaller piece that goes inside that actually works the hinge. But this is, uh, this is how we attach it, just like that. For your plant stand, it can go in your plant, you know, boom, it'll, mm -hmm. it'll stick right in there. We sell a lot of these, and uh, most of the times they'll use them in the house, but Keep in mind, if you wax and finish your piece of glass correctly, you will not have any problems with oxidation even outside. I hope that answers your question. And, uh, oh, great. Okay. Yeah, welding, bra a brown brass welding rod will work too because you can solder to it. Anything brass, you can solder to if you flux it. So I hope that, that that works. If you're doing something big, use a heavier bronze rod or brass rod. And if you're doing something small, then the jewelry box hinge seems to work pretty good. I was trying to figure out how do you hold, hand hold this and work the... So thanks, Gary. We, we appreciate that question. And uh, so we're going to see who else has got us a question here. So we answered the question for the light box. My light box that I work off is four foot by five foot. But we do a lot of big windows and um, I, I wanna have enough room to lay that full sheet of glass on that table. And in most cases, I take out of that sheet of glass what I want for that particular job. See, we had a question about kilns. Yeah, I had a question about kilns. Now, I'm not gonna promote a specific kiln but I will tell you the kilns that we use here in the glass shop and have used for over 25 years. When we first started out we bought a really nice 28 inch octagon Gen Kin kiln. However, guys if you're going to be firing glass there's a lot of books out there now that weren't available when Barbara and I started but if you're going to be firing glass, please get a top fire kiln. I know, yeah, well, you could probably pick up ceramic kilns pretty cheap because somebody didn't feel like doing any ceramic work. However, your glass doesn't heat evenly. So we use top fire kilns only. 
and we also we can fire in our annealers. Now we have an annealer in the glass studio that is top fired and it is four foot by five foot. We have another annealer that's a stand up. I call it the refrigerator and it is 24 inches deep, 60 inches long and 29 inches tall. Now we enjoy that one. We usually fire our paintings in that one. So we really enjoy that. So uh, I hope that answers your questions about the kilns because uh, like, again, I, I can't promote any other kiln than what we use. We use a Gen kiln, Gen Ken kiln, and you know, they're out of Florida. Usually ship in just a few days. Great people to work with if you have a problem. And all of their information is online on their website. Very, very good people to work with. Same way out at Denver Glass Machinery. Holly's great to work with. They will custom make your kiln for you, but please get them. Make sure if you're going to be working with glass, get a top fired kiln so that the glass heats evenly. And those of you that are having problems with, oh, this breaks when after I, I, I did it so long and I, and I, and I did it right and, and everything. But you know what? When you show your picture online, guess what? You have a kiln that's fired from the side. That causes breaks because your, your glass cannot heat or cool evenly. So anyway, it's just personal preference and I prefer to use top fired kiln. So I hope that answers your question about kilns. Any questions about soldering or anything like that or how old that is? And and why is my hair so frizzy? Because <laughs> <laughs> well, we put 392 miles on the RV today. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> we just got in. We just got in. We got to see our grandchildren this weekend, and it was awesome. And we got a lot of projects going on, so we needed a break. Because right now, now that we're back in town, we're hammering down. It's Memorial Day weekend, and we're not going anywhere. We're staying home. So we hope everyone will be safe. It looks like we got, we have only uh, three people. Um, next time we'll be better set up. We wanted to use StreamYard, and uh, we couldn't get that set up, so we went uh, with our mobile, and I guess it's not as reliable as we yeah. thought it would be. So we apologize for all the shakiness yeah. and the... Yeah, uh, <laughs> and some of you, I had two questions come in about... You're, uh, you're applying, you're cutting your pattern for your copper foil project, and then you're tracing the pattern onto the glass. However, nobody mentioned using either copper foil shears to take that little bit out of the middle that will make up two pieces of that copper foil, or using my double razor blade taped together with a match head between it so that you can cut your pattern out correctly. If you're just using regular scissors, your glass isn't gonna to fit together correctly because after you grind it, you foil it, there's too much room there, you, you, um, it's not gonna work. So please use your pattern shears or use the razor blade trick that I showed you in the, in the video. You can go back and check that out and um, so the razor blade tr trick to remove the center line on your copper foil project, or please use your copper foil shears, okay? It's all good, it's all good. I got a lot of, re a lot of feedback from every reminding everybody that you really should be using a rheostat as well. So thank you, because you'll find out that if you're using that rheostat, you can control the heat much, much better, and your work is gonna look more professional every time you pick up that soldering on. Practice, practice, practice. After several hundred miles of solder and you'll have it down pat. Well, let me check. Let me, I'll scroll down here a little bit. Yeah. Oh, some of you had a, one of you had a question about to use zinc on the outside of your stained glass window. You know, it's okay to use zinc on the outside of your window, but it's not okay to hang it from the zinc. Even though zinc won't stretch like lead, it is not something to hang your window from. You really should, if you can, I mean, if it's a small piece, you know, like the piece we did in the video, little seven and a half by 12, you know, that's fine. That, that amount of weight isn't gonna hurt it because the zinc can handle it. However, 
don't use a wire that's going to stretch like copper. Eventually copper is just going to stretch and just pull apart. And I get a lot of them brought through that front door and that's exactly what's happened to them. So you can use zinc on the outside, but don't hang it unless it's less than one square feet. If you do put zinc on the outside, buy those clamps I show you in the video where we're building those frames and spend the money on the wood, build the frame correctly and make your customers happy. And they'll never bring that piece of glass back because it broke and fell. Wood frames are the way to go. Uh, and I, you, you, zinc is more expensive than the lead is. So on the outside of everything that I do, I use 3 8 flat H or I use a, a half inch flat H, depending on the wood that I use. And the wood is cheap. And the wood is much cheaper than them bringing it back to you and say, hey, this thing fell. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. You know, once you, once you make your customer happy, you just need to keep them that way. And, uh, and by using wood and not using zinc on something that's any larger than one square foot, you'll keep them that way. You'll keep your customers happy. There's a lot of people using zinc, though, so, you know. Well, there is, and it's kind of like you don't want to you don't want to do lead on the whole window and then put zinc on the outside and put it in a door. The zinc is rigid, the lead is flexible, and it doesn't matter if you use 50-50 solder or not because the lead and the zinc are together. Wear and tear on the door is going to break the joints between the lead and the zinc. One is rigid and one is soft. And when you have those two things together, it means break. And that's just, I've found this out over 40 years of being in this industry. Tell, us, tell them about your um, experience. Because, I mean, they probably don't know. Well, yeah, you probably don't know. And all that yeah, so. Fancy um, stuff. <laughs> yeah, all that fancy stuff. So, um, you know, my, my background in the glazing industry is in high rises. And, which is big glass, curtain walls, working off of scaffolding, swinging stages. And I did that, I've been doing that since 1979. And it's, it's just enjoying that end of it when you're young, it's fine. So uh, how I got into the stained glass was one winter, work had slowed down a little bit here at the beach and I had a choice. I could get laid off in the glass department. I took, I opted, I said, well, why not? What the heck? What was very interesting is she found out that I could draw and and drawing is so important. And, and if you say to yourself, oh, I can't draw. Yes, you can. I promise you, you can. And there's a lot of little helpers that we have in the stained glass industry but anyway I ended up once she found out that I could draw I ended up working in the stained glass department for oh probably three or four years and it, during that time I learned how to hand bevel glass on on an old Covington machine uh, of beveling it was uh, 14 different wheels 14 different processes horizontal wheels vertical wheels uh, pumice polishers the whole nine yards all of a sudden you know then i found myself back out in the high rises because 82 or 83 there were 39 tower cranes lined up from surfside to north myrtle beach this place was rocking and high rises were rocking and i was a very busy young man and uh so anyway that's that's where i'm at so the last high-rise job I ever worked on before we went into business for ourselves in 1986 was the Yachtsman Resort. Just a little, little building, 16 stories tall, all reflective glass everywhere, eight years ago. About eight years ago, we got out of the commercial high-rise business, and we, we just found that we wanted to do our art, and we wanted to just be more personable and, and not have all the headaches of dealing with all that stuff. So... Welcome to the Glass Studio. Welcome to the RDRV channel. And don't forget, you can give us a thumbs up if you like us. We Maybe have all these, these people. Are I know. Subscribers. Uh, we may have some new people. I don't know. <laughs> but you know what? Let's see. Uh, oh, Gene, hey, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome, Gene. I'm glad we could help you. And if I don't see a question there, but you're welcome. She's asked questions. So oh, you have? Okay. In the past. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you have. I hate using pattern shears. Lee, hey. 
I got a dumpster in the back that's 10 yards. I like to throw every pair in there. However, when I teach classes, I teach the proper way to do your pattern. But, Lee, there's a video, and, and I'm not sure which one it is, but I can, I can explain this to you. Get two single-edge razor blades and a roll of black electrical tape. Well, it doesn't have to be black. It can be any color, as long as it's electrical tape. Take, a mat, take the two razor blades, put a match head in between the two razor blades, tape them up all but the first. I'll draw you a picture, Lee. I'll draw you a picture real quick. So what you're going to do is you're just you're going to take two single edge razor blades and you're going to put a match head in between it and then you're going to tape it. Okay? So when you look at it, only this much of the razor blade is showing right here. I hope you can see that. And those that those two razor blades now are separated that much. And guess what that is? That's what takes your shears take out. And then you can put your hand right on this, right on the top of this razor blade, and you can just cut the center line right out. You can see my fingernail on the paper bar, mm -hmm. just like that. You just take that razor blade, and there are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Your pattern shears, and I, I do find if you want to keep using them, use the back of them. Don't try to use this part up here because you can't control it. If you use the back right there, if you use the back, the paper will shoot out the bottom automatically. It won't clog up up here and you'll be able to do your turns, but you have to go. You have to move your mouth. To you have to <laughs> kind of chew it. But if you use that back jaw, you can get your inside curves and your outside curves attacked properly and not waste a lot of paper and get frustrated. When you get frustrated, Lee, set it down, walk away, grab a cup of coffee or a cold drink, take a look outside, find a cardinal, and then go back to work. <laughs> so cool, thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, Lee, that's good. You know, this is supposed to be enjoyable, so when you get frustrated with it, just, just go do something else, you know? Just go do something else, just for a few minutes. And you come back and you have a whole different outlook on everything. I know I do. So I get frustrated sometimes just cutting glass. And everybody's like, hey, Ed, what kind of saw do you use? Hey, guys and gals, I don't use a saw. I cut it all by hand. And I've, uh, I have only cut glass by hand the entire time I've been in this industry. What you do is improve your cutting skills each time you work with glass, okay? And then I had, I had a, a question, a, a girl said that she used to push harder when she couldn't hear the, hear the cutter. Well, because the glass, the colors are stacked in art glass, your cutter will change, the noise, the sound changes as you go across it. The important thing for you to remember is the pressure that you have on your cutter here needs to be the same pressure when you come off on the back end. And please, please, don't cut on a metal table. Cut on wood or cut on a very, very short napped carpet. Almost like, and actually what works the best that the glass tables are covered with is felt. And that way when you come off, you're not going to damage your wheel. The only way you're going to damage your wheel on that expensive cutter that you should be using is if you accidentally drop it on the concrete. And then it's going to be like a flat tire. And if you hear that, please get a new cutter because that's just frustrating waiting to happen. The last little bit of glass that we had ordered came in for the Oak Tree Project and we're going to get it unpacked tomorrow. I'm just going to start cutting glass. This is lead work, cane work, so stay tuned. We're going to be doing some cane work. I'm going to show you. I got a brand new pair of lead nippers that I actually have been looking for for years. And I'm gonna check on being able to find them, see if I can get a, some more pairs of them for you guys. So I'll let you know that on Monday night. And I'll show you these lead nippers. They're awesome. And I, I've been, they're not just wire cutters, y'all. They're lead nippers. They're made for what you do for a living. So hey, everybody, this is Ed and Barb, RDRV channel. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you guys. We appreciate you putting up with us this week. <laughs>
See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, y'all. Thank you. you. Good night. Love you guys.